number is the 407-221-7378. Is that correct? Yes, that's or, and when it says sent, that would be the phone from which it's sent? Yes, sent from the phone. Okay. And then the one that's receiving those would be 407 616 4234? Okay. But the phone that they are recovering these from is from Dory's phone, not from. Oh, it's from Okafer's phone. Okay, I'm with you. All right, and what is the, and you're, this person who's coming in is a detective? He's a forensic examiner and he's testifying on the other side of the interview that he did. He did not testify in the arrest. These are text messages that have been just deleted. able to from this phone 407-221-7378 to recover these deleted messages. All right, what is the objection going to be? Well, wait a minute. You said hearsay and then you said remote in time. Those are two different things. Which one are you arguing? Turn, turn your microphone on, would you please? I'm going to argue hearsay, first of all, because, one, you still haven't established this phone. We don't know who is on the other, other side of this uh, phone phone texting, and we don't know who actually has a, has a phone at the time of the texting. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that that number has been associated with Mr. Oakford, but still no one has established that Mr. Oakford has any phone. That phone was being used by everybody in that household. Uh, so I would say it's hearsay. Uh, and then in addition to that, Your Honor, I would think also that it's too remote in time uh, to to be admitted to prove anything in this case. Any that other? Would be some, I believe, Your Honor, that's probably almost eight, nine days before this uh, September 10th uh, incident occurred. I'm sorry, 16 days. Okay. So here's Sam remoteness. Any other objections? No, sir. All right. Uh, Mr. Altman, the objection as to hearsay. I would say it's not relevant because at this point, <coughs> Ms. as the court may, may recall, in Mr. Altman's opening, he stated unequivocally that 
he believed that Mr. Oakley was a shooter, and he believed Mr. Oakley used a revolver because there were no uh, shell, case, shell, shell casings discovered. And based on that, Your Honor, I would argue that to try to bring in a clip or anything that can't be linked up to the evidence in this case would be irrelevant and ought to be excluded. It would be an it would, be, would allow an impermissible inference that is, and thus far we haven't heard that from anybody, including the prosecutors who uh, did a very uh, thorough job in opening saying that it was a revolver. So why would we allow, allow uh, something in about a clip some 16 days earlier uh, that has nothing to do with this case? It would only be intended to prejudice, prejudice the jury. It wouldn't have any probative value. It's not introduced to prove anything material in, in fact because it had nothing to do with this. 16 days prior to the, the uh, offense in this case. Yes, sir. Yes, there's no evidence that a semi-automatic was fired during this shooting. In fact, we don't believe that happened, but we do have evidence that uh, one of the home invaders had a semi-automatic pistol, which we, I assume, could have been loaded with a full clip. No, I was, was we can't we can't keep going back and forth okay. arguing it. I was going to cite a case, Your Honor, if I could. Well, don't cite a case. Give me a copy of the case. Uh, well, I can give you this case. Uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, Morton State, 173. cartridges that have not been linked to the case, and I'm, I'm going to argue that these cartridges is the same as this clip that has been linked to this case. That case clearly says it's a reversible error to do so when it's not been linked up. And here, you know, he's asking you to admit something that happened 16 days before this offense occurred, and through his own statements, it has nothing to do with this case, and we're asking the court to exclude it. Hang on just a moment. This is a 3.850 motion.
I've reviewed the case. The issue as to hearsay is one that I have to tell, I have to listen to the testimony for. It's an evidentiary issue that the court has to determine whether a proper predicate is laid in this matter, and then I can rule on it. I can't rule on it in a vacuum. The remoteness of the time frame is close enough in proximity that it would not be something that the court would exclude on remoteness. But I'll reserve on your other objection. You can raise it again when the witness is testifying. Thank you. Thank you. Are we ready to get our jury back in? Yes. Okay. Please be seated. Welcome back. I know you think we just got in here. We did not. We've been here since 1.30 uh, working on some matters to try and save some of um, your time. I need to ask you, has anybody contacted any of you or approached any of you since you left here for lunch? If they have, please raise your hand. I don't see any hands. Has anybody conducted any research on computers, newspapers, videos, internet, uh, TV, or anything else on any of the issues, the parties, the attorneys, or the witnesses? If they have, please raise your hand. And has anybody seen any of the other jurors conducting any research on this matter? Don't see any hands. Anybody cold? I see some of the shawls are being used. There's more over there. If you need them, feel free to grab them. Uh, we're going to go ahead and continue on in this matter. Mr. Alton, would you call your next witness, please? I don't think that the deputy heard. Over to the deputy here. Are you checking your approach, Your Honor? I'm sorry? Are you approach, Your Honor, on this? Uh, you may. Let me just get her seated if I can. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. We will be with you in just a moment, okay? Ma'am, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to ask you uh, to talk into the microphone. That chair is bolted to the ground. Everybody try to pull it forward. Okay? Would you introduce yourself to the jury and spell your first name and your last name for us? Yolanda Bennett, Y-O-L-A-N-D-A, B-E-N-N-E-T-T. -T. 
Thank you very much. Please proceed. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, thank you for coming in. Um, let me take you back to uh, September of 2012. Um, at that time, did you know a person named Emanuel Wallace? Yes. And you'd previously identified him in the courtroom? Yes. Okay. And um, did you did you have a phone back then, a cell phone? Yes. Was it the same phone you have today? No. Same phone number? No. Okay, you had a different phone number back then. Yes. Do you remember what your phone number was back then? Yes. What was it? 07-715-3822. And uh, did you have a number of text messages with Emmanuel Wallace um, on September 9th of 2012? Well, we used to text a lot right. back then. And I know you were asked this, uh, you were interviewed by Detective Mureshi, uh around that time, and you told him you had a bunch of a lot of text messages with him that night. Is that right? Yes. Okay. You, you don't you don't remember what the contents of those text messages? Were. No. All right. And you let me just get something very clear. You don't know anything about a murder who did anything like that? No. Right? Okay. And uh, do you remember today the phone number that Emmanuel Wallace had? No. Did you have it in your phone at the time you spoke to Detective Moreshi? Yes. And did you show it to him on your phone? You got the little address book out on your phone and you held it up and showed it to Detective Moreshi? Yes. Okay, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Any cross? Um, Chris Bennett? Yes. No. No. Thank you. Anything further? Ma'am, you are free to go. Thank you so much. Please be very careful going down. Hold on to that side. Right. Who is your next witness, sir? Thank you for joining us, ma'am. I'm going to ask you to lean into that microphone. That chair is bolted to the ground. Everybody tries to move it forward. You want to be about two inches away from the microphone, if you would, please. Would you introduce yourself to the jury and spell your first name and your last name for the court reporter, please? It's Candia Lewis, C-A-N-D-I-A-L-E-W-I-S. Thank you, ma'am. Please proceed. Good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you for coming in. Um, Let me take you back to September of 2012. Did you know a person by the name of Emmanuel Wallace? Yes. And how did you know him? He was my boyfriend. Let me just make something very clear. You don't know anything about who committed a murder or anything like that, right? No. Um, where did you live back as of September 10th, 2012? On Equitation Court. Do you remember the address? 8016 Equitation Court. 8613? Does that sound no, right? No, 8016. 8, 8016, okay. Um, and 
did you know a person by the name of uh, Bess Minokopa? Yes. And how did you know him? He had kids with Emmanuel's sister. All right. And were Emmanuel and, and Bessman friends? Yes. Um, did you have a, do, do you know where, well, let me ask you this, were you home the night of the murder, September 9th, 10th, 2012? Were you at that Equitation Court address? No. Do you know where Emmanuel was at that time? No. Um, did you have a cell phone back then? Yes. And what was that? cell phone number. Do you remember? My number, 407-394-4759. Okay. Um, and you said that Emmanuel also lived at that Equitation Court address? Yes. Uh, do you remember today, did you, did, did you ever know Mr. Wallace's phone number? Yes. Do you remember what it is today, what it was back then? I can't really remember right now. Do you remember testifying previously, um, including at a deposition on July 31st, 2013? Yes. And, uh, and you were asked about what his phone number was? Yes. And did you have a better recollection back then what his phone number was? Yes. Would it refresh your recollection to look at that deposition transcript to yes. see what his phone number was? Yes. This is on page uh, 29. Yes. What was his number? It's 407-326-4071. I don't have any other questions. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Cross-examination? Oh, hang on, ma'am, just a second. Don't be quite so anxious. <laughs> we'll get you out of here in a minute. I promise. Miss um, Lewis, correct? Yes. Did you know any of Emmanuel's friends? Yes. Did you know Nolan Bernard? Yes. Were they friends or cousins? Cousin. They were cousins? Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Burner. Any redirect? All right, ma'am, thank you so much. You're free to go. Hold on to the side there. Please be very careful. Those steps are steep. Call your next witness. Ed Michael. Have a seat, sir. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Uh, move that microphone up just a little bit, if you would, please. All right. And I'm going to need you to be about three to four inches from the microphone. Your voice is pretty deep. It should pick up. Would you introduce yourself to the jury and spell your first name and your last name for the court reporter? My name is Edward Michael. It's E-D-W-A-R-D, M-I-C-H-A-E-L. Thank you. Please proceed. And where are you employed? I'm a detective with the Orlando Police Department. 
How long have you been there? I've worked there for 15 years. Do you have any area of specialization as a detective? I'm a detective assigned to the Technology and Forensics Unit as a Digital Forensics Examiner. And what is a Digital Forensics Examiner? In our unit, I take in um, all forms of electronic evidence, such as cell phones, computers, things like that. Um, what we do is we process those items for uh, evidentiary evidence to, for a case. Um, then we present our findings to a detective, the primary detective assigned to the case. Um, and what are your qualifications for that position? I have a bachelor's and a master's in information security. Uh, in addition, I have about over a thousand hours of specialized training in dealing with um, the majority of it is in cell phone forensics, um, also with computers, hard drives, things like that. Um, I have multiple certifications on the different tools that we use. I've attended multiple training seminars on the tools that we use along with general uh, digital or computer forensics processes. Um, in addition to that, I teach uh, uh, privately for two separate companies, specifically on matters of, uh, of digital forensics. You taught overseas? Yes. Um, I teach one company. Uh, we travel uh, overseas twice a year. And then for the other company in the United States, um, I go to various cities, basically wherever they send me, um, to teach other detectives, uh, depending on the course, either basic digital forensics concepts as it relates to phones, um, or I also have an advanced class that I develop um, that I teach um, here in, uh, in Orlando once a year. And you said you had a master's degree in, in what? Information security. Okay. Um, have you ever testified as an expert in court? Yes, I've testified a total of 13 times as an expert. Uh, 11 times were for a circuit court for Florida, similar to the way we have trial here. Uh, the other two times were for uh, federal district court, uh, middle district court of Florida, which covers Tampa or uh, Orlando. Um, now, in this particular case, did you help out with a search that occurred at 1241 St. James Road in Orlando, Florida, and I believe it was September 10th of 2012? Yes. And uh, let me show you what's been... Yes. This is an evidence envelope uh, that we seal our evidence in. Um, it feels like what's inside of it is, is one of the items, is this a phone? Uh, once I open it, I'll know for sure, but I would say yes. Are you going to ask him to open it? Let me make sure. Mr. Mosley, do you wish to look at the packaging or voir dire the packaging at all before it's open? No, no. Okay, please proceed. Thank you. Yes, this is one of the phones I examined. Yes, and, and I apologize. And one of the ones I recovered from uh, the address in St. James Place. Yes. Yes. Uh, for this particular phone, uh, we use the, the SIM card. Uh, inside of it, and that holds the the information that the carrier uses to access the phone, um, and stored in that SIM card is the phone number. We have a device that we insert it to, and it reads it. Yes. Yes, several hundred times. Uh, the phone number for this one is four zero seven two two one. Seven three seven eight. All right. Um, and and what kind of phone is that? This is a Samsung. Well, here's what my question was: Is it is a smartphone? 
Yes. Wait a minute. Hang on. Sorry. Yes, sir. I need to know the legal objection. Uh, Fourth Amendment objection, you got a right of privacy. A Fourth Amendment objection, right of privacy. All right, please approach. Is overruled. You, you were saying it's a some it's a Samsung phone. Yes. Okay. And, and is this what we would call a smartphone, something that connects to the internet? Yes. And is this a phone that can send text messages as well as make phone calls? Yes. All right. Um, were you able to? Is there a date and time that's in that phone? Yes, as part of the internal memory of the phone, it retains the, uh, the date and time. And were you able to determine whether that date and time was correct? Yes, when I examined the phone, actually I was the one that collected the phone uh, from the residents in St. James. Um, when I first collect the phone, uh, we, we photograph it in place. And that's one of the several things that we do is check the date and time on it, and it matched when it was seized. Did you look for text messages inside the phone? After I completed my exam, yes. All right. It's part of your exam, though, you did that. Yes. Well, well, let me. All right. Let me. Let me start somewhere else. Uh, did, were you able to determine at all um, whether uh, Bessman Okafer um, had used that phone? Yes. And how were you able to determine that? After the extraction, the way we extract the data from the phones, I look at the complete data from inside the phone, and we look at several things. Um, Usually the obvious thing is, is the content of text messages, um, selfie shots where somebody stands in front of the mirror um, holding uh, the phone so they can be seen, um, along with registered email addresses and accounts on the phone. Um, in this case, if I can refer to my... Your Honor, I'm now objecting to what you Yes, sir. Talking. Okay, let's go ahead. Sidebar.
folks, I apologize. Sometimes things that was bordering on do I take them out or not take them out, but we, we try to do it with you there. I apologize. Uh, the objection is overruled. Please proceed. I believe you were uh, testifying about evidence that this was Mr. Okafer's phone. Yes. And, and what was that? I probably would just have to repeat it. I apologize. Um, so again, I, I believe I mentioned text messages and things like photos. Um, the type of extraction that I did in this type of phone lets me look in kind of the underlying files that run your phone, um, as opposed to just the things you see if you were to pick the phone up and, and scroll through it. Can I get you to get a little closer to that mic? Yeah, Sean, sorry. Your phone is deep, but you've got an old judge, so I need to get sorry. You closer to it. Thank you. So as part of uh, so as part of that examination, uh, for the way I extract the data from the phone, I can again I can see those underlying files. Uh, that kind of make the phone work. Um, part of that data that's kept in there are things like email addresses, account numbers, account information, um, and there was multiple accounts, email addresses um, that were that were tied back to to Mr. Okafer. What about uh, Facebook profiles? Yes, uh, Facebook profiles was one of was one of the items that were signed in. And under was his there name. A, a Facebook profile that was signed into? Yes, if I can refer to my report. Sure. The Facebook profile that was assigned in mm -hmm. um, had a username of Made Man. It's M A D E M A N, and the email address that was used was Bestman Okafer at AOL.com. The Facebook, the picture for the profile um, for Facebook matched the, the picture of the defendant. And was that the only Facebook profile that was used on that phone? Yes, that was the only one used on that phone. Um, were you also able to tell um, the location of the phone at the time of these Facebook entries? Yes. So when you're using certain chat applications, um, Facebook is one of them. It was one of several. Um, your location information is actually kept in the background. Um, whether you allow your phone to do it or not, it's just a matter of whether it sends it to other people. Um, so one of those tables or fields that I can examine with the type of extraction in the phone allows me to, to look at that GPS data. Um, the GPS data is, is stored when a user sends a message. So in other words, um, when the person signed into this account, in this case um, uh, Mr. Okafer, um, Facebook message people, every time he sent a message, that, lo that location was stored in the phone. And was that location consistent with his residence address? Yes, I tracked the last two uh, Facebook messages that were made um, on the night of September. One was uh, September 9th, 2012 at 1710 hours. Um, and then there was a later one on September 9th, 2012 at 2343 hours or 1143 p.m. What about voicemails? Yes, voicemails uh, were stored on the phone as well. I believe I pulled two out for um, what we call evidentiary value. They had meaning to the case. Uh, the two I recovered, uh, both messages were, were messages left for uh, Bestman Okafer. Okay. You, uh, you mentioned this is a smartphone, correct? Yes. Um, where internet searches, Google searches can be made on it? Yes. Did you, uh, were you able to extract any Google searches that were made on September 9th of 2012 that appeared to have evidentiary value? Yes, let me just pull, pull those up specifically. So again, one of the items um, we, we can recover are our uh, internet history items. Um, I found several that were relevant to the case that I pulled from this phone um, on September 9th, I'm sorry, well, let me ask you the one about, I think it was one September 9th at 2111 hours. Yes. Okay, and what's that, 911, is that what that is? 911 p.m. Okay. And what, what was that search? Uh, there was a search, um, an actual search that was typed in, uh, with, is how do you remove gun residue? The user clicked on the top two searches. Um, one was a Yahoo site, or somebody else had asked the same question. Um, so the user of the phone clicked on and viewed that answer. 
and the other one was a website with the title of Removing Gun Gunshot Residue from Clothes and Skin. Did you uh, see any uh, articles or searches that were made after the murder before you got the phone on September 10th? Yes. There were additional searches done. Uh, let's see if I can find the first one here. It is, it is leading, it's, it's developing the testimony. He's just pointing it to a segment. Mobile. Yes, I did find additional internet searches done later that day. And, and what was the one on at 12, was there one at 1223? There was one on September 10th um, at 1223, which is about eight hours after the homicide occurred. And what was that all about? Uh, that was an article from clickorlando.com, which I believe is uh, News Channel 6. The title of the article that was clicked on was One Dead, Two Shot in a Coe Home Invasion. All right. Um, did you look for text messages on this phone? Yes, the text messages um, proved to be a challenge. Why, why were they a challenge? Based upon the type of exam I did, um, when I initially recovered the phone, um, we use a tool called Physical Analyzer. It's written by a company called Celebrite. It's C-E-L-L-E-B-R-I-T-E. -E -E. That tool kind of looks at those underlying files that we need and kind of puts it into human readable format for us. Um, the initial exam I did in the phone showed that um, it only showed, I believe it was maybe 15 or 20 text messages just from the day of the homicide, from September 10th after about um, 8 o'clock in the morning and all those had been deleted. There was actually one, what we call an allocated text message. Um, so if you were to look at your phone, if I can give an example, if you were to look at your phone, an allocated text message would be one that you pull up a person and you see you have two texts with them. That's what we call allocated. Um, when you delete the text message, it's gone from your screen, but it's still kept in the phone in several different databases, different locations. Um, and until that database, there's internal stuff that goes on, until that database is what we call vacuumed or purged, whatever term you want to use, those messages are still able to be recovered. Um, so what the tool did is it showed me the one allocated message that I could have looked on his screen and saw, and then it showed me um, about the 14 or 15 other text messages that were deleted from the same day. The reason I said it created a problem is um, based upon the other user activity on the phone. For example, I had call logs that went all the way back to May and June. I had internet activity that went back to February, March. There was a lot of usage on this phone, so it was very suspicious for me for these huge chunk of text messages all of a sudden all the way up till 8 o'clock in the morning didn't exist anymore. Were you able to, just because they're deleted on the phone, were you able to extract them? Yes. Um, but by doing a more detailed man manual analysis, um, instead of depending on the tool, we go in by hand and there's some techniques we use to pull that data out. Um, it was discovered that um, all, all the text messages Basically, were the phone, the text messages were deleted twice on that phone. Um, based upon my experience and training um, and, and my opinion as an expert, the text messages were deleted um, prior to us seizing the phone um, based upon the com communication when the police were outside the house. They were subsequently deleted earlier, um, probably before 8 in the morning, the, the, the 10th. All the texts were cleared out. So there was two deletions that happened. Um, so I kind of worked backwards, and I apologize to the jury. So moving forward, um, you had the time of your homicide, and then at zero at around eight, the text messages were all wiped out. Use the phone during the day, um, and then before the phone was seen, the, seized, the text messages were wiped out again. But you were able to extract the text messages. Yes, um, I don't have the exact number that I did. Um, I only recovered ones relevant to the case, but all the text messages I manually carved out, I believe there was something in, around eleven thousand text messages. Legal basis. Overruled. Um, let me, uh, did, did you recover some text messages from August 24th or August 25th, 2012? Yes. Um, and could you tell a phone number that those text messages were with? Yes. How were you able to determine that? 
this was part of that, again, that big mass deletion of text messages that occurred. Um, things that are stored in the text message internally are things like the phone number, the name of the person, if, if they're in the contact list, um, the date and time the text message was sent or received, excuse me, the content, um, some other additional data that the carriers use if there was a picture attached or, or, or anything like that. But the phone number is attached to each text message. Your subjection is overruled. Yes. Um, these show communication between uh, Mr. Okafer's phone and uh, a person who was in his contact list as Dory. Yes, the phone number listed, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the phone number that the communication occurred with um, was 407. 616 426 Yes. Thanks. Mr. Altman, let me let me see you and and uh, Mr. Mosley at the bench for just a minute.
Objections overruled. Please proceed. I'm sorry, Mr. You were offering it, weren't you? Okay. Okay. Go right ahead. Yes. Yes, that's the evidence. I mean, the report that I prepared and those are taken right out of the database that stores them in the phone. And over objection. I, you have your objections on the record. The court overrules the objection. It will be admitted as the next numbered exhibit. <coughs> Mission to publish this to the jury? You may. I don't want to tax your abilities, but you might want to zoom in on that. Do you see those on your computer? For the most part. I don't want to attack his abilities either. Okay. Okay. And the title is the title correct? It says recovered from Okafor's Samsung eight thirty five cell phone four zero seven two two one seven three seven eight deleted text messages with Dory. You get that phone number on August twenty fourth two thousand twelve from eight fourteen p.m. to nine oh six p.m. Yes. This first column where it says phone number, that's the what is that? That that's the phone number that the communication was with. The next column says name. That's the name that was given to that phone number in the contact list. I didn't pick that name. That was who he was in the phone as is Dory. The next column says date, time, GMT. What's that? Greenwich Mean Time. Yes, Greenwich Mean Time is the way when your phones store data, um, at least Apple and Android phones. Um, everything is stored in, in GMT or UTC, everything's stored. Um, so this way it doesn't matter what time zone the phone was in when the call was made or received or the text message, it's always stored in the same format. And then we, um, we manually adjust whatever time it is, which is what you'll see in the next column where it says local. The next column is date, time, local, so that would be Orlando time. Correct. And uh, it's, it's stated in, I guess it's military time, 2014, what, what is that? Yes. Uh, just the way the way the way we list them. If you're not familiar with military time, just take that number and subtract twelve, and you'll get your your seven, eight, nine, ten p.m. So that's eight fourteen p.m. The first one is eight fourteen p.m. Yes. And then next is method. And what what does that show? Uh, where the word sent is, that would be a message uh, sent from Mr. Ker Mr. Okafer's phone um, to the Dory contact, um, where it says RCD. Um, which is where I abbreviate received. So to make it a shorter column, that would be a text message that was received by the phone. And the content is uh, verbatim from the from what you extracted from the phone. Yes. Right? So the first one at 2014 is, did you get that? And that is a that is sent from Mr. Oakley's phone. Yes. And there's a response. He said he was going to be on his way at 8:30. Yes. And the next one is from Mr. Okafor's phone, cool, he says. Yes. And the next one, uh, at, and this is now 849, it's here with a full clip. Yes. That's, a, that's from Dory's phone. Yes. And then uh, let's just go to the one at 2100, and, and that's sent from Mr. Okafor's phone, right? Yes. And what does that say? Uh, the one on uh, at 20 hundred hours, uh, Mr. Oak first sent Dory's phone a text message that said, they say all the witnesses are going to show up. And that's 2100 hours. Yes. And the next one is from Dory's phone at 2102 and says, damn, who told you? Yes. And then Mr. Oak responds at 2106, my lawyer. Yes.
whose uh, name in the address book was Twan. Yes. Uh, on September 9th of 2012. Yes. These are the text messages I recovered uh, between uh, Mr. Okafer and the contact listed as Twan, and then Twan is T-W-O-N. Yes. Uh, the messages that are uh, selected here are from September 9th, 2012 at 2127 hours or 927 p.m. Um, up until September 10th, 2012 at 428 in the morning. Yes. Yes, sir, it is. Assume the same response. Ruling will be overruled. You may. Yes. Yes. That that was uh, five twenty seven p.m. Did I say that wrong? Yeah. Seventeen twenty seven. Yes, sir. And. Uh, the response from Twan is, what happened? Yes. And then Mr. Okafer says, can't text it about my case. Yes. That next blank area was, um, it was just in it, there, there was no content. It was just an empty message like, like your finger skipped on the send button or whatever. And then there seemed to be some messages about, um, Talking about getting some stuff. Yes. Now I see um, the one from 2109 received says, didn't find S asterisk asterisk asterisk. Okay. Yes. Not so easy to say. Um, did you ever, did Juan, when he sent that message, put in an asterisk? No, some of the phones have a, uh, I don't know, swear filter, naughty word filter. Um, and apparently his was turned on. So it does the first letter and then drop the last three. That was the actual text message that Twan's phone sent, and that was the actual text message that Mr. Okafer's phone received. Okay, and there are further messages, and let me just point out the one at 2112. Damn, bra, I, mean, I need that stuff. That's sent from Mr. Okafer's phone. Yes. And at 2127, damn, check everywhere, bra, this is a must. Yes. Okay. The final one is at 12:28. I'm gonna need you, Bras. So that's sent from Mr. Oakley's phone. Yes. When do they MAC that one? Yes. Uh, MAC address is an acronym for Media Access Control. Um, did you do anything with this phone concerning MAC addresses? Yes. Can I expand on what a MAC address is sure. a little bit? So any device that connects um, wirelessly or through Bluetooth um, has a unique number. It's called a MAC address. And that number is uh, a long hexadecimal number. It has some letters and numbers in it. Um, but what it is is it's assigned by the manufacturer. Um, it's eight characters long. The first four characters identify the manufacturer. 
the last four characters are unique to that device. Um, so in other words, every cell phone everybody has in their pocket that has a Wi-Fi that can connect to Wi-Fi, that phone has a unique MAC address to it. Your laptops have a MAC address. Um, I mean, we can go on and on. Um, You're drifting away from that microphone. Sorry. Sorry, Your Honor. So uh, taking the uh, one of the th uh, things that also have a MAC address is your, your a wireless router at a house or a business or anything like that. Again, because it provides wireless communication, it, uh, it uses that, that MAC address. Um, so what happens is your wireless router, a wireless router, transmits that MAC address. And that's kind of how you find. It's one of the ways that you would find um, Wi-Fi, such as in this building. I believe it's called Ninth Public or something like that. Um, kind of going on in the background is your phone or laptop would see that MAC address. It's the same thing that goes on in your residence or in your house. Uh, so on, do you want me to do, uh, continue? Why don't we get the question posed? He was explaining it. Now let's get the question. Okay. Can you explain what Yes, for, for now. Um, you, you mentioned wireless routers have MAC addresses. Yes. Would every time a cell phone would be carrying a wireless address, it, connect? it won't automatically connect. Um, to, to, and it's kind of changed a little now. Um, but this make and model phone at the time, um, kept a kind of running record in the background of all the MAC addresses that it saw. Um, it, it was, it's, I don't want to say subconscious, not the right term. It's transparent to the user. In other words, when this phone was in Mr. Oakworker's pocket or whoever pocket, whoever, he didn't know what was going on, but it was keeping a constant record of all these MAC addresses that were seen. Is there a, uh, a record of every MAC address uh, that that phone uh, was in contact with? Uh, or is no, the record, it's, it's forever changing as you obviously, as you move around. Um, I mean, if you were to keep the record for even more than a day or two, there would be several, several hundred entries. Um, on this phone, the particular file stored, um, or I was able to recover, it looked around like 20 uh, MAC addresses. So it would store 20 MAC addresses? Yes. Would there be 20 other users? Yes. I did uh, experimentation with another phone that was the same make and model and it used what we call first in first out method. Um, in other words, the very first one it saw as it reached that limit would be the very first one out. And it just rolls through that throughout the, the day. So it would be fair to say these are the 20 other users in the transaction? Yes. And you recovered this phone uh, during the search of Mr. Oakford's house on the evening of September 10, 2012? Yes. Uh, so it would show as of that time the 20 most Yes. All right. Um, now, when you pick that up from the phone, it's just this long identification number? Yes, for the most part. So you don't really know where those MAC addresses might be? No, that's really the only thing that's stored there. Um, the, I recovered this file from a what we call the an unallocated area of the phone. It's kind of an area where deleted things are kind of shoved off to the side until they're written over. Um, so the fragment of this file didn't have any date and time information with it, didn't have any location information with it. It was just this unique number um, or the unique series of numbers that I found um, that were tied in with, with other MAC addresses. Did you ever go to the area of Drive Yes, sir, I did. And I'm looking desperately for the date that I want it here. Give me one second. Here it is. On uh, September 19th, 2012, I went to uh, the 503 Bernardino Drive ad uh, address. And did you go in and around the neighborhood a little bit? Did you believe that it might have been the, uh, the point of travel or the, the direction of travel that, that the uh, phone made itself? Yes, I was provided by Detective Mareshi. I was uh, provided information which it was believed that maybe the vehicle or the, the, uh, the suspects in the case took. Um, we have a device that's called a Fluke. Um, it, you can buy it online. It's nothing magical. It's, they're just expensive. Um, what it, all it really does is take these wireless signals and just allows you to track them. I don't mean track like record their data. I just mean 
um, it just captures a snapshot of all the wireless um, these MAC addresses that it sees. Um, from there, you could actually walk around if you were to use it to full of its ability and and um, and actually find an access point. Um, so I, I took another uh, detective and I went. We used this fluke and we started in, uh, in actually in the kitchen next to the wireless router at 503 Bernardino Drive, and I captured a snapshot. It's basically just taking all the wireless MAC addresses it can see and capturing it. Um, and then I recorded nine points throughout the route, throughout the neighborhood, um, where I was led to believe, which was the route the suspects took, to capture these different MAC addresses. And did any of the MAC addresses that you uh, captured with the fluke match any of the MAC addresses that were in the 20 most recent MAC addresses in your cell phone? Yes. Um, I numbered the points one through nine, and then I just put them on a Google map so I could remember where I was when I did it. Um, so point one was inside the kitchen. Uh, point two was actually at the end of the driveway, um, standing on, on the property line between the street Bernardino Drive and the house. Um, two of the MAC addresses that were seen by the fluke in that location um, were also uh, located in Mr. Uh, Okafer's cell phone. And, and where, where would you pick up these MAC addresses um, if, if you were there at the house? At the, near the house? For the type of network, that these MAC addresses were on what's called a G wireless network. Um, the range is, I mean, the factory range, they say it's 300 feet um, in environmental conditions based upon your building and trees and moisture in the air and everything. Um, the average is anywhere from 75 to 100 feet. And if you were, say, in the driveway of, uh, of, that, of that house at 503 Bernardino Drive, would you pick up any of the MAC addresses in that cell phone? Yes. One moment. Any objection? Oh, okay. All right. The previous objection. All right. The previous objection was overruled. Remain overruled. It'll be admitted as the next numbered exhibit. Thank you. No, sorry. I'm not going to keep those. <laughs> Cross examination. Yes, sir. Um, now you're testifying here today about what you found inside the phone, correct? Correct. And you're not testifying as to possess the phone at the time? As far as if I factually can put it in a person's hand? Right. As no, said, w without, physically seeing the, without physically seeing the phone in a person's hand, no. Right. As you said earlier, you said uh, you, make, you testified to the phone being in Mr. Okafer's hand or whomever's pocket, what you said earlier. Correct. But you don't know, right? I know that we use uh, totality of the items found in the phone um, to, to place them in. But, I mean, with 100% certainty, I mean, no. I mean, that couldn't be. Right. And did you know that that one phone was used by two brothers and a sister in that same house? I was informed of that, yes. You, you're aware of that? Yes. So you knew that Brent lived there, Trent lived there, and Candace lived there, right? Yes, I knew they lived there. And you knew they all used the same phone? Sustained. Okay. And when you, and when you say Mr. Okafer's phone, have you ever gone to Sprint to see who owned this phone? Uh, I did not... Go to Sprint. No, uh, Detective Mareshi provided me with the 
what's called the uh, the carrier records. Um, it's basically who you pay your bill to. Um, and my information uh, from the carrier records came back to a relative of Mr. Okafer, um, who also was the um, owner of record for five other phones that I examined. In other words, one person paid the bill for five phones or had five phones in their name. And did you know that Emmanuel Wise from time to time used that phone? There was no evidence of that. Thank you. Any uh, redirect? Sir, you may step down. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Be careful of the step there. I won't fall. Madam Clerk, would you make sure you have all our exhibits so that none of them are accidentally walking out with us? Okay. Call your next witness. State recall Detective Michael Moreshi. Seat, sir. I'll remind you, you're still under oath, and would you put your name on the record again, please? Yes, sir. It's uh, Michael Moreshi. Please proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Detective, last time you testified, I told you that we would recap every time. Now I'm going to break that rule. Uh, do you remember at some point during the investigation of this case conducting an interview with a man named Antoine Leclerc? Yes. Specifically, did you conduct an interview with him? in December, on December 5th of 2012. Yes. Who was present for that interview? It was myself. Um, I yes. believe it was uh, Assistant State Attorney Ked Lewis, uh, Antoine McLaren, and his attorney, Roger Whedon. Do you know how that interview came about? In other words, who arranged it and why it was conducted in the first place? Uh, Mr. Whedon reached out to the State Attorney's Office. Okay. Mr. Whedon being Mr. McLaren's attorney? Correct. All right. Where was the interview conducted? At the state attorney's office. And Mr. McLaren was present, correct? Yes. With his attorney? Correct. Uh, and then you asked him questions? I did. And at that point, he gave you some information relating to Mr. Okafer that was more detailed than his past interview? Yes. At any point in your interview with Antoine McLaren, did you promise him anything? No. At any point in your interview with Mr. McLaren, did you threaten him in any way? No. Senator, may I approach the witness? You may. You recorded, audio recorded that interview, right? I did, yes. And it was subsequently transcribed, right? Yes. And I hand you the document, 1152, if you want to look at the front, orient yourself, and let me know if you recognize that transcript. Yes, I do. And what is that a transcription of? It's the uh, statement of Antoine McLaren. Um, you could read to yourself the first five or six lines and see if you recall the conversation you had before that interview began with Mr. McLaren. Yes, sir. What did you tell Antoine McLaren? Well, even, even with him showing up with his attorney, I wanted to make sure that this was a voluntary statement on his, behalf, on, on, uh, his part. Uh, so I established that he was uh, here without coercion or promise and uh, that he was here on his, specifically asked him if, this, if he was here uh, on his own, and he said yes. I also want to ask you about Sharia Gordon. You conducted multiple interviews with Ms. Gordon, is that right? I did. At any point in time, did you ever tell Ms. Gordon what Mr. Cicerone had told you? No. Did you ever tell Mr. Cicerone about what Ms. Gordon had said in her statements? No. So you never gave them the information from one another, is that Cor fair? Correct, yes. Okay. Now, 
going back to your previous testimony, you indicated uh, previously that you, last time you testified, you had been uh, executed a search warrant at 1241 St. James Road, correct? Yes. And did you then go back to the crime scene on uh, September 11th, 2012, the day after the murder at around 1 p.m.? I did. What was the purpose of going back to the crime scene that afternoon? Uh, we went back to, to canvas the neighborhood uh, to, to knock on doors, talk to neighbors if they saw anything. Did you speak to anybody when you did that? I did. Did you eventually speak to the homeowner at 630 by the time the police had stopped? I did. Show it to Mr. Mosley. Let me see if he has any objection. Uh, yeah, I just want to make sure he has no problem with it. Okay, go ahead, sir. Detective Reshi, your screen should be on. It is, yes, sir. Six thirty Butterfly Creek Drive. Can you show us where it is? Yes, it's right there. So it's it's the corner house. Correct. And what's the name of the homeowner that lived at that address that you spoke to on September eleventh? Her name is Elna Acurena. When you spoke to Ms. Acurena, did she indicate she might have some information helpful to the investigation? Yes, she did. After you spoke to her, what is it that you did at that address? Uh, I went inside and, and viewed a video system that she had set up. How many video cameras did she have providing surveillance of her home? I believe she had three exterior cameras. And do you recall one specific camera that looked out on Jackson Street? Yes, I do. And can you tell us, uh, or show us on the map actually, what the view, where the camera was located on the home and what the view was that it provided? The view, it was, it was attached to the rear corner of the house uh, in this rear corner and it shot out this way. Was the angle of the video from that camera, could you see the park down here at Sleepy Harbor and Jackson? You could see that intersection. It was obviously dark at the time, that, that the parts that we were viewing, but you could see that intersection. Did you actually view previously recorded video from her system? I did. Did you specifically view video between 5 a.m. and 5.30 a.m. on the morning of September 10th, the night of the murder? I did. When you viewed the video, did it have a time stamp? It did. Did it have a date stamp? Yes. Did you take any efforts when you were viewing the video to verify the date and time on the video? I did. What did you do, if you could tell us, please? As I watched the, the video on their mo on Ms. Acarena's monitor, I, I called into our department or Coe's police department uh, and asked uh, what time that they officially had on their on their record. And when you did that, was the time the day date was accurate and the time stamp was put on the video? Yes. Mark a state's exhibit C and three Y. You may. Yes, I do. And what do you recognize it to be? This is a uh, copy of the uh, video I obtained from Elma Acarena. And that video is the complete video with no time. Is that right? That's correct. And how do you recognize it? Uh, I viewed it and uh, I put my initials on it. Okay. Now I'm showing you State's Exhibit T in evidence. Do you recognize that video? Uh, yes, it's the uh, it's the same video. Now does that video have a timestamp on it? It does. And did you watch that and initial that disc? I did. Now are both are both of these videos in the exact copies of the video we watched from her residence on September 11th? Yes. When you watched the video on September 11th, did it have information useful to your investigation? It did, yes. Uh, did you request that, well, did you personally take the video from the system that day? I did not. Okay. 
So how did how was the video eventually obtained and given or obtained by the Orlando Police Department? I, I asked for one of our CSIs to go to the house and, and retrieve it. Now, when you got it back in your possession, an OPD and evidence, did it have a timestamp? It did not. Okay, but the video you viewed did. Yes. So at some point in the transaction, the timestamp went away. Correct. As your investigation unfolded, did you ever compare the content of Nestle Cicerone's statements to you to the content of the video? Yes. And did the video corroborate the statements from Nestle Cicerone? Yes. In regards to vehicles used and time arrived? Yes. Detective, at some point, did you ask a member of the Orlando Police Department to take photographs from the Orlando Police Department? I did. Look at the photos and tell me if you recognize them. I do, yes. And what do you recognize them to be? Those are uh, still photographs of a white Chevy Impala passing in front of that camera uh, at Butterfly Creek at a little after 5 that morning. Are these still photos clearly and accurately representing the video that you were offered? Yes. Yes. Was one of those videos a traffic camera at an intersection nearby the crime scene? Yes. Can you tell us about the your obtaining the video from that particular location, where it is and how that came about? There is a, a red light video at Clark and White Road, which is about one mile from the crime scene. Uh, and it's the closest major intersection from the crime scene. Um, and we just, contacted the, the company that owns the camera, American Traffic Solutions, and asked for their video for uh, the time around the crime. Did you personally go to that intersection and view the intersection that the camera had a view of? I did. And that witness has much been marked. You may. Tell me if you recognize the areas depicted on the map. I do. And what do you recognize them to be? Uh, the crime scene, the red light camera, and the marathon gas station. And does that map fairly and accurately depict the locations on it? Yes, it does. What do you mean, a map or an overhead? It is a map overhead view. When you viewed the video, or did you eventually view the video that was obtained from American Traffic Solutions? I did. And when you viewed the video, did it have a timestamp? It did. Did you recognize the vehicles that were on the tail end of the two hours that were provided? Yes. And did you, with a, was the direction of travel that those vehicles took consistent with the testimony you received from Nestle Cicerone and Sharia Gordon? It was, yes. And was it also consistent as to the time frame with the video that you had from 6.30 Butterfly Creek Drive? Yes. May. 
a look, if you could, and tell me if you recognize it? Yes. And what is BC? What does it contain? It is a copy of the red light video. All right. And then also case exhibit B. Tell me if you recognize that video. It is also a copy of the red light video. Case exhibit B is shorter than state BC, correct? Correct. And case exhibit B has a comment on the door. That's correct. I did. And were they, was the timestamp on B accurate as to the video on BC? Yes. And did they both depict the intersection that you have personally been to and witnessed? Yes. Finally, Detective, did you supervise the obtaining of a third surveillance video in regards to your investigation? Yes. And where did that video come from? That was from the Marathon gas station, which was located about three and a half miles from the crime scene. Did a member of law enforcement eventually obtain video from that gas station? Yes. Now, did you ever personally go out to the gas station? I did, yes. And so you looked at the surveillance video yourself, is that right? I did, yes. And then just as in the other piece of evidence, you sent somebody back to pull it from the drive? That's correct. When you viewed the video, Yes, I did. I did. Yes, I did. You may. Yes, I do. It is a copy of the Marathon gas station video. It is. It's a series of photographs. Do you recognize the still photographs in the composite? Yes, it is. And what do you recognize those photos to be? Those are uh, still photographs from the marathon uh, video tape. And do they fairly and accurately depict the video that, is, uh, that you observed in regards to this incident? Yes. And that's 11 photos for the record. And finally, case exhibit W, composite of 10 photos. Please look at them and tell me if you recognize them. Yes, I do. And would you recognize the photographs in W to be? Those are still photographs from the red light video. That's correct. Your Honor, at this time, the state seeks to admit state's exhibit A, B. Any objection? Will it come in as the next numbered exhibit? Tell us, tell us what that is, just for record purposes. It's a map, Your Honor, of that contains the marathon, the location of the marathon gas station, the camera at Clark and White, and the crime scene. Thank you. Detective Moreshi, 
in the video that I showed you from the Marathon gas station, you said you recognized persons within it. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, the Sharia Gordon was inside the marathon paying. How do you know it was Sharia Gordon in the video? Uh, she's very pregnant in the photograph. I'm sorry, Mr. Publish. You may. You may. Again, Detective, if you could just now for the jury show us, orient us to the map, what we're looking at, and the video you obtained from the places on the map. Uh, this accurately shows the the red here is the uh, is the crime scene. Uh, this is the intersection of Clark and White, and then the Marathon gas station is right here. Cross-examination. Okay. Detective, um, I believe the state's O. Uh, you said you recognize the persons in the video. And uh, you're talking about one person. Yeah, one person. Okay, so you're a Gordon. Correct. Okay. Nothing further. Okay. Any redirect? No, no. Sir, you may step down. Thank you so much. Thank you. Folks, let me give the jury just a five-minute break, and then when we come back, we'll finish up for the rest of the day. Folks, do not discuss the case. Uh, leave your pants on your chairs. When you come back, check your pads to make sure you have enough pages. If you need more, and we'll see you in about five to ten minutes. Five, ten minutes, folks. There's enough for restroom break. Then I need to 